The Association of State Dam Safety Officials is pleased to present this online education program. This program is Introduction to Inspecting Dams for Owners and Operators. Our speaker today is Paul G. Schweiger. We are very pleased to welcome all of you to this program. My name is Sean Brown and I will be the moderator for today's seminar. Please note that today's call is being recorded and all participant lines will be muted. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Paul Schweiger. Mr. Schweiger is a Vice President of Gannett Fleming and has over 26 years of consulting engineering experience. He has served as a project engineer or manager for the design of 10 new dams, including four NRCS dams, and the design and technical review of many dam rehabilitation projects. He has inspected hundreds of dams across the nation, including over 100 dam assessment reports for the NRCS. He was also responsible for conducting dam safety inspections and performing failure mode analysis for 16 high hazard dams on the island of Oahu following the Kaloka Dam Failure, and providing dam safety training to Hawaii's state dam owners, regulators, and consulting engineers. Paul, welcome to the program. Let's get started. Thank you very much, Sean, and welcome everyone to this first in a series of webinars that are being developed by the Association of Dam Safety Officials Dam Out Owner Outreach Advisory Committee, and they're, they're specifically designed for dam owners and operators. Just uh, if you're not familiar with the Association of Dam Safety Officials, it's a nonprofit organization with over 3,000 members, and they have a common vision of making a future where all dams are safe. And an important part of their membership includes dam owners and operators. It's, it's no surprise that a key part of accomplishing this goal of making a future where all dams are safe is to provide outreach programs for dam owners and people who are responsible for operating and maintaining dams. Now, the Association of Dam Safety Officials does a lot more than uh, provide training. They also have all kinds of technical resources. Uh, they have conferences and uh, do a, a lot uh, of other things to uh, promote dam safety uh, across the nation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the very end. Now, during this presentation, we're going to cover three, it's going to be in three parts. The first part is covering dam fundamentals, and that's pretty much covering um, everything, the, the, the very basics of what dam owners and operated, operators should know about dams. The second part includes inspecting embankment dams, and as you're going to see, embankment dams are by far the most common uh, type of dam. And then part three, we're going to be looking at all the inspecting all of the appurtenant structures, and that includes inspecting spillways, the outlet works, drains, and instrumentation. Now, there are different kinds of dam inspections, and the, the terminology that we use for a certain type of inspection can be different depending on which state um, you're in. But the, the three basic types of dam inspections, the first would be a routine in inspection. And that's uh, rather casual. It's sometimes called a patrol. And it's the simplest form of inspection where the dam owner or maintenance staff uh, may periodically walk around the dam, drive over the dam, and uh, just make sure that uh, there's are, are nothing unusual going on at the dam site. The next um, type of inspection is called a regular inspection. That's uh, normally scheduled on a regular basis, maybe monthly, where you go out with a checklist and uh, you inspect all the features of the dam and just fill out a, a simple checklist, maybe take some pictures, or you, it's something that you might do um, immediately prior to an event. For example, if you know that a flood condition was about to occur, that they were forecasting heavy rains, it's a good time to do a regular inspection, or immediately following an event like that, or say a seismic event you would go out and do that type of inspection. The next highest level of inspection would be an engineering inspection. Sometimes that's called an annual or a biannual inspection, depending upon what state you're in. And that's normally uh, performed by a professional engineer, somebody that specializes in dam engineering and uh, he needs to complete a report and that needs often to be submitted to the state. Now, the, what we're going to cover here in this uh, webinar pretty much focuses on the regular inspection that a dam owner and an operator might do. 
And of all the inspections, um, that could be the possibly the most important inspection. I recently uh, watched uh, a, a video uh, seminar put on by uh, Ralph Peck, who is a former eminent uh, engineer who, with an international, uh, he's internationally recognized as being a dam expert, and he was talking on the subject of monitoring dams and the importance of instrumentation. And he made the comment that, in his opinion, the regular inspection was probably the most important thing a dam owner could do uh, to minimize risk and to be able to identify a problem developing at a dam. So that just uh, emphasizes why this webinar is important. And that's the kind of information we'd like to share with you today. Now, when you do a dam inspection and you find something that's unusual, you know, what do you do about it? And you're going to find that in this presentation, I have very few word slides. We have a couple up front, but after this, it's pretty much going to be a lot of pictures. And what I'd like to do is show you different parts of the dam and things that you might see and some of the deficiencies that you might find. Now, the question is, once you find a deficiency, what do you do? Well, the, the simplest thing, and for, for minor deficiencies that you might find, one action item would be to monitor it. And that might be, let's say you see a crack in a wall or a minor seepage condition. That's something you'd want to put on your checklist that you noted that, and then you'd want to monitor it. And you may want to make a, some measurements as well. If it's a seepage condition, you'll want to quantify how much seepage. If it's a crack or something like that, you may want to measure it. And then that's a, a way of monitoring it. Now, if you see something more significant, uh, you may want to take a, a higher level of action. And that may include uh, repairing or maintaining and, uh, the, the deficiency. And in a case like that, uh, maybe a feature of the dam was vandalized. There's a missing sign. Uh, you may need to lubricate a gate hoist. Uh, the trash rack of a spillway or conduit may be obstructed, and, and it needs to be opened up or uh, removing unwanted vegetation. And repair or maintenance is something that the dam owner and uh, operator could do without any uh, coordination with state officials. It's something that, that's basically expected to do. Now, if you see something that's more serious, and that would be escalated to a, a higher level of action, and that could include uh, an engineering evaluation by your engineer. In other words, you see something going on at the dam that is changed, it's unusual, and uh, it needs a, a higher level of assessment. And something like that might include new seepage condition, uh, movement or settlement of an important feature. And something like that should be coordinated with your state dam safety office. Now, there is one higher level than that, and I hope nobody ever has to um, deal with this, and that would be an emergency condition. And you could be out doing this inspection, and you see a condition that's changing, and it could be rapidly changing. And it has the potential to lead to a uh, failure of the dam or an uncontrolled release of water from the dam. And in that case, you'd want to immediately call a county EMA, your engineer, and also this, get the state dam safety office involved. And I'm going to show you some examples of different deficiencies and how they might be escalated to these different levels. And uh, that will help you to decide whether or not um, you know, what's the appropriate action to take. Now, I'd like to go through uh, this part one. This is an outline. We're going to start with some dam statistics, just some basic information about dams. Uh, what this graph shows is on the x-axis the number of dams built, and then on the y-axis when they were built. And most of them here, when you go above uh, 1900 up to about the year 2000, it's broken up into decades. And by the way, if you see this uh, red arrow moving around, I'm controlling that and just placing it in different places for emphasis as we do the presentation. But what, what you'll see here is that the average age of most of the dams in the United States is now over 50 years old. And that the peak of the dam building era was between 1960 and 1969. So in the 1960s, that's when the most number of dams were being built. In fact, during the, the uh, peak of the dam building, uh, time period, there were over 600 dams per year being built in the United States. Now, an, an, uh, an engineer named Patrick Reagan with the uh, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, did a study back in 2009, and he analyzed more than 1,100 dam failures. And he, he found uh, some interesting 
information from doing that. And he, he learned that approximately half of the failures of the dams of the dam failures that he looked at, they occurred after 50 years of operation. And that, that's important. And the conclusion is an extended period of apparently successful operation does not indicate an equally successful operation in the future. So uh, the mentality that, hey, I have a dam and it's been around for 70 or 80 years and it's, it's tried and true, you know, it doesn't need to be inspected or, uh, you know, it, it's proven itself is, is not always the case. And that some failure modes take a long time to develop and also uh, some materials like concrete and uh, steel can, their properties can change over time and as they deteriorate that could also lead to a failure mode. Now here's a map of the United States and on it is plotted all of the state regulated dams according to their hazard potential. And you may notice that uh, the state of Alabama has no dams in it and that's not because there, there are no dams in Alabama but it is because uh, Alabama is the only state in the United States that is not does not have a state regulatory program. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that there are three colors of dots. There's the red dots, the yellow dots, and the black dots. The red dots um, are for high hazard potential dams. The yellow dots are for significant hazard potential dams. And the black dots are for low hazard dams. And most states will classify dams according to those three categories. The high hazard dams has the, the hazard potential really has nothing to do with the condition of the dam. It could be brand new, state of the art, in excellent condition. What it has everything to do with is the consequences of the dam if it were to fail. And for high hazard dams, if they were to fail, there is a significant, it is likely that uh, there could be loss of life uh, from the, the failure of that dam. For significant hazard dams, in most cases, the consequences of dam failure are limited to property damage downstream, which can be significant. And for low hazard dams, there's generally understood that there's no potential for loss of life and that the economic damage would be limited to the property of the dam owner. Now, if you look at all of the dams in the United States that are state regulated, uh, approximately 11,000 of them are high hazard about the same number are significant hazard, and then the balance, about 67,000 or 66,000, are low hazard for a total of almost 90,000 dams. When you add all the federal uh, regulated dams and state regulated dams together, there are over 90,000 dams in the United States. Now let's look at some dam features in terminology, and that's particularly important when you're trying to inspect it and you're inspecting different features and entering that information in a report, you want to make sure that uh, you're using the right terminology. And when uh, dam is inspected, sometimes we refer to the left and right. It could be the left wall, training wall of the spillway, the right training wall, the right abutment, the left abutment. And for consistency, whenever you're doing that, if the left and right is if you're facing downstream. So if you're on the top of the dam and you're looking downstream, uh, here we would have the right abutment and then we would have the left abutment of the dam. We have the reservoir, and then we have the top of the dam. In this case, it's an, an embankment. It's an embankment crest. Now, I, I'm showing you a dam, and I, I'm saying it's typical, uh, but there really is no such thing as a typical dam. Uh, I like what one of my colleagues says. He says, dams are like snowflakes. There's no two alike. Every one of them is unique. But most dams have typical features, and that's what we're going through right now. So the top of the dam is an embankment crest, and then the upstream slope of the dam, and the downstream slope. And then we have the part where the dam meets the natural terrain. At that intersection, that's called the groin. And you can have the left groin, the left upstream groin, the right upstream groin, the left downstream groin, and the right upstream groin. Then we have uh, a, a principal spillway. In this case, it's a drop structure type spillway that's out in the reservoir. And there are all different kinds of spillways. But the purpose of the principal spillway is to maintain the reservoir level. So most of the time, uh, water is flowing in the principal spillway. And then we have uh, a conduit that passes through the embankment. And that's the principal spillway conduit and then a low-level outlet, the discharge point at the toe of the dam. 
and then we have an outlet channel that conveys the water back into the natural stream. And then we have an auxiliary spillway. Sometimes the principal spillway and auxiliary spillway is combined, and uh, sometimes they're separated. When they're separated, it's generally understood that the auxiliary spillway is there only to pass very rare extreme floods. In most cases, the auxiliary spillway will be activated for the 100-year flood or greater. And, uh, and that's to prevent the dam from being overtopped. Now, dams are very interesting. They, they can have a lot of other features like this one does. They can have instrumentation to monitor the conditions within the dam. They can have gates, bridges. You can see in this one there's a bridge over the spillway. There are access roads, uh, conduits and valves, and sometimes there may be a fish ladder at the dam. Now, let's talk about dam types. Here's a list of the major dam types that, that you might see. And the one thing you'll see that's in common here is that the dam type is, in this list really depends upon the kind of material or the type of material that it's made of. You can have an earth embankment dam, a rock fill dam, a concrete dam, a masonry dam, a timber crib dam, a rubber dam or an inflatable dam, a steel dam. So the material is, is really the type of dam, the material that it's made out of. Now, we just don't have time to go through every type, but this uh, graph just can show you the wide range of different dam types, like a timber crib dam here. Here we have an inflatable dam, uh, a double arch, concrete dam, uh, a buttress dam, a slab and buttress dam here. Here we have a steel dam or steel gates, a concrete gravity dam, and in the center we have our earth embankment dam. Now, we, what the, the most common types of dams are earth embankment dams and concrete dams, and they make up almost 97% of the dam types in the United States. And here's a, a graph showing you the different dam types on listing them on the bottom axis and then the number uh, on the y-axis. And it becomes very clear that by far the majority of dams are earth embankment dams. So we're going to spend most of our time um, looking at earth embankment dams and the features and inspecting them. Now just to give you a little historical background, the first embankment dams were homogeneous dams. In other words, the material that the embankment was made out of was uniform and it consisted of available earth material uh, from the site and they would just be piled up to hold back the water. So that would be a homogeneous earth embankment dams. Oftentimes, it was built directly on the overburden. And the overburden is that loose material above the rock, the bedrock. So if you were to dig down far enough, eventually you hit solid bedrock. But all that uh, sand, alluvium, uh, soil, whatever uh, loose material there is between the ground and the bedrock is referred to as overburden. And then when you get down to the bedrock, uh, it's a, a solid rock. It could be sedimentary, it could be igneous, it could be all different kinds uh, depending upon the location and the geology. Now, what happens when you have a reservoir behind an embankment, uh, there will be seepage through that embankment and all dams leak. The, the key is to control that seepage. And what we're very much interested in is where is, how is that seepage occurring and is it controlled and where is the phreatic line within the embankment? Now, that's probably the most technical term we're going to use today, and let me just explain that. The phreatic line that we have here is the zone of the embankment that's completely saturated. And that's important to know where that is because that will determine where the seepage comes from. In this case, the phreatic line is very high and it daylights on the downstream slope of the dam so that if you were to inspect this dam, you would see that this lower part where the red arrow is showing is, uh, would be wet and there could be seepage observed coming from that. So that's very important um, to know and, and to control that. So there could be seepage through the homogeneous earth embankment fill. There could be seepage through the overburden and there can be seepage through the bedrock. So as, as uh, engineers learn more and more about dams, they, they saw how important it is to control the seepage through the embankment so they begin adding features. And here we have a blanket drain, which can be a, a sandy material or a combination of sand and gravel. And it's designed to intercept any seepage in the embankment 
and make sure that that phreatic line doesn't daylight on the downstream slope so you wouldn't see any seepage there. And that can be, that, uh, can be very important in controlling the seepage and making the downstream slope stable. Other things that engineers began to do, especially when they had problems with the overburden material, where there could be horizontal layers of more pervious material like gravel or sand, and that can develop some really high exogradients at the toe where water will want to well up um, under, uh, at the toe of the dam. And in that case, they could install relief wells, and that helps to relieve the pressure at the toe so that the seepage at the toe is controlled. Other things that were done was to put in an upstream blanket. In other words, to extend the impervious material further upstream into the reservoir to make the seepage path much longer. And that, was a, an effective, that can, it can be an effective way of controlling seepage. Then, um, if the overburden wasn't too deep, um, another effective way of controlling seepage through the overburden was to excavate a cutoff trench and then to place uh, compacted earth material in there to make that zone more impervious, more watertight, and, and control the seepage through the overburden. And to control the seepage through the bedrock, they could excavate a trench and, and make like a concrete cutoff wall. Or the more common practice is to grout the foundation by drilling holes into the rock and then pressure injecting grout. In some cases, it can be a single line grout curtain. In other cases, it can be three lines, depending upon how uh, much verification and um, water tightness you're trying to accomplish. And then as time went on and uh, uh, the construction equipment became more sophisticated and were able to sort through available materials and make better use of them, uh, engineers began to design zoned earth embankment dams. And here, uh, making good use of the more impervious material, often clay and called impervious fill, putting that in the core of the dam and right through the cutoff trench, and then using the more gravelly and uh, pervious uh, materials on the upstream and the downstream uh, parts of the dam. And that, that is, is a, a, a much better use of material, and you get a better performing dam. And then, um, Starting in the late 1970s and early 1980s, it became standard practice or very common practice to install a chimney filter drain and blanket drain, a much more elaborate drainage system within the zones of an earth embankment dam. And if you were to design a dam today, this is pretty much standard practice. And it, it uh, provides a much more reliable and lower risk dam so that if there was a crack to develop or a seepage path or something like that, it would be intercepted by this chimney filter and drain and safely can filter the water so that there's no loss of embankment material and it would uh, convey that water safely to uh, the drainage system. These chimney filters and drains normally consist of uh, a concrete wash sand or a carefully graded material that's compatible both with the clay core and the other uh, zones of the embankment. And it, it generally, if there was a crack or a defect, it's very forgiving and it can heal that part of the dam. And then um, there are other features. If it's a very tall dam, we can have a uh, tow berm or uh, protect the upstream slope with riprap or other material to prevent erosion. The other type, uh, common type of dam is a concrete dam, and that makes up another 7%. And that can be that slab and buttress type that we looked at. It can be a, a concrete gravity dam. It can be a masonry dam, a multiple arch dam, or a more modern uh, type of concrete is roller compacted concrete. When you look at a concrete dam, we have a, a lot of the same numbing nature. A couple things are different. Here we have the left and right abutment, like we would have uh, for an earth embankment dam. And then in this case, we have the overflow section of the dam. So there's generally a part of the dam that's the spillway, and that's designed to be overflowed. And at the toe of the spillway, there's normally a stilling basin to dissipate the energy that goes over that spillway. And then there's the non-overflow section, the part that's designed not to be overtopped. And then the part of the non-overflow section that's above the crest of the spillway is the chimney section. Here's a good example of a big concrete dam under construction, and you can see a cross-section of the dam here, and that it, in this case is a concrete gravity dam, it's solid concrete, 
And most concrete dams are built on a rock foundation. They're not built on overburden because they, they have a very small footprint, often less than a third of what would be the footprint required for an earth embankment dam. And that's, you, you can have very high uh, flow gradients underneath, and that's why it has to be on a rock foundation. Now let's quickly look at spillway types. And there, there's a, a large number of different types of spillways. They're generally ca ca categorized based on their shape, uh, their configuration, or uh, how they work, like a fuse plug or a gated spillway. And uh, again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about all the different kinds. I will go through a couple of examples, especially when we're looking at inspecting these spillways. And uh, the, they are all designed to do essentially the same thing, and that is to safely convey uh, water uh, over or around the dam in a safe manner to prevent it from being overtopped, and to uh, have some kind of energy dissipation so that the downstream channel doesn't get eroded. Now, most of the dams in the United States um, were designed by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. They, uh, out of the 90,000 dams, um, almost, I think it's 27,000 were designed and built by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, formerly the Soil Conservation Service, and they all almost have this identical configuration that you see in this picture. And a lot of other dams have this as well, even though they weren't designed by the uh, NRCS. There's the principal spillway, and the, it's really a riser structure or a tower. In most cases, you only see the very top of it. And if we were to take a closer look of, at that, with a reservoir that's completely drained, it would look something like this, so that we have at the very top a drop inlet. And that has trash racks on the wing wall sides of this here and here, and with a weir section. And as the reservoir comes up, uh, it will flow down and drop into this structure. It has intermediate gates for uh, lowering the reservoir and maintaining areas around the reservoir. It, it has a low-level uh, drain gate at the very bottom for draining the reservoir. And then in this case, it can have some uh, extra features. And this one has a water supply intake on the side, which is less common. Then at the downstream end, there is normally uh, some type of energy dissipation structure. In this case, uh, the most common is an impact basin. And what that looks like, here we have the conduit right there, and the water comes out like a jet. So there's, it's under a lot of pressure. It hits this baffle uh, wall, and then there's a lot of turbulence inside this structure, and that dissipates the energy. Uh, another common configuration is just to have a plunge pool uh, at, at the toe of the dam. And then in this case here, since it's a flood control dam, as the water uh, in the reservoir goes up, and this spillway has a limited capacity, it needs a much bigger spillway to pass the floods. And so we have an auxiliary spillway, and in this case, it's an earth cut or rock cut spillway over at the right abutment. So during an extreme flood event, the water will enter the upstream side of the spillway, referred to as the forebay area. It'll cross over the control section, which is the crest of the spillway, and that's the highest part, and that controls the water. Uh, that discharges through the spillway, and then it has an exit channel that exits and, and safely conveys the water beyond the toe of the dam. Now, looking at outlet structures, there are uh, three basic type of configurations. This is the most common, and it's, it's where we have a principal spillway here, and it's combined with the principal spillway, so we have a, a conduit. And what's important about this conduit is that it's an unpressurized conduit. And that is most of the time the flow is by gravity, and uh, it's the, the flow that's in the conduit is only partially flowing, and it's not under pressure. And when there, the reservoir is down, water can be released by opening the gate at the bottom. So that's that's the combination outlet works and spillway, and and that's that's uh, the most common type. Here's a schematic where we have a drop structure, and we have this long conduit and then it discharges through the impact basin. And that, that shows that configuration. This is essentially the same configuration. It's an outlet works configuration with the upstream gate, um, but no tower. So the tower is removed. And the only time water will flow through the outlet works is when the operator opens up uh, the gate that's right here and releases water to drain the reservoir. This is another very common configuration. It's a very safe configuration because the conduit is always dry unless the gate is open to lower the reservoir so that there's always an upstream closure. 
Now, th this is what that might look like if you went and saw a dam that had that configuration. So here's the operator up along the slope right down to the bottom. And in this case, the reservoir is completely drained. Now, another configuration, which is less common and a little bit more problematic, is when we have part of the conduit or the outlet works um, submerged, and then we have the control structure right in the embankment. But we still have upstream closure and the conduit is not um, pressurized. And now, as you can imagine, this is critical that it, it makes it more difficult to inspect the conduit, especially the part that's underwater. But now the gradient, and if there is any seepage or anything like that, uh, the part of the embankment that it can flow through is much smaller. So that, that can be a, a bigger concern. And here's an example of one of those structures built within an embankment. And lastly, we have a outlet works configuration with a downstream control valve. And that might look like, well, that's pretty convenient, that makes sense, but that is really uh, a very um, dangerous and it, it, as far as dam engineers are concerned, it is not a good configuration. There are a lot of older dams um, that have been built with this type of configuration. The problem here is that the conduit is always under the full pressure of the reservoir so that if there was any problem with that conduit, there's no way, there's no upstream closure here, so there's no way to shut the flow off. Now, the only way that that's acceptable is if that pressurized conduit is inside another conduit like this, or if it's encased in concrete and uh, in the abutment of the dam or within the foundation rock of the dam where um, it, it, it's, comp it, it's much safer and it can't leak or, or develop a uh, problem. Here's a, an example where there was a problem. So we have the uh, gate at the very downstream toe of the dam. There's no upstream closure. And you can see over time, everything deteriorates, including the gates. And in this case, these gates are getting ready to fail. They're corroded. They're already leaking pretty bad. And the dam owner can find himself in a very difficult situation if there's a failure here. Or even worse, if the, the conduit begins to uh, decay or corrode or a uh, joint opens up or something like that, and now you've got a pressurized condition somewhere in the embankment, and that can uh, create a failure of the dam. Which takes us to the last thing, and that's instrumentation. Um, this is the most common types of instrumentation, staff gauges, monuments, CPs, weirs, pedometers, crack gauges, inclinometers. Out of all that, most dams will generally have these two uh, types of instrumentation, and they work together, and that's a staff gauge and a seepage weir. And the staff gauge just tells you what the elevation is in the reservoir. It's often mounted on a, a, a feature like a, 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 a training wall in a spillway or something like that, or it can also be a, a standalone structure in the reservoir. The most common problem I've seen with these is that they are not high enough. They should be extended right to the top of the dam so that during a flood event, you're able to monitor what the reservoir level is. And the second uh, most important, or actually the most important instrumentation in the dam would be any uh, seepage measurement device there, like a seepage uh, collection weir like you see here. This is a small broad crested weir at the uh, uh, toe of the dam. And it could be in a gallery or in a weir box like we have up here. And the purpose of that is simply wherever there's seepage in the dam to collect it and to monitor uh, the quantity of seepage. And it can consist uh, simply of measuring the seepage out of the conduit in the drain. And in a case like that, it's just a matter of sticking a bucket underneath with a stopwatch and measuring the volume of water being discharged over a period of time. And you can get a very accurate measurement of seepage. And what we're looking for is any changes in seepage. Now, it's important that whenever you measure seepage, that you also know what the reservoir level is because there's a relationship between the two. The higher the reservoir level, generally the more seepage you will get. And the last time I put this uh, webinar on, I got a lot of questions that came in afterwards. My dam doesn't have a seepage uh, collection point or a weir or something like that. Is there another way to measure seepage? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can install uh, a, a, a seepage weir very easily. And here's one where we took a sheet of metal and cut in a V-notch weir, dug the trench, and then placed fill around it, sealed it up, and uh, excavated a small uh, reservoir area upstream. And here you can see it, it working. And that provides a, a fairly good way of measuring seepage. 
Um, I'm not, and that's what it looked like um, when all that was installed at the toe of this dam. Another way is if it's using sandbags, and uh, here we have a conduit, and the key there is to seal up the area that's seeping to allow the water to uh, pond up and then discharge it through a conduit like this, and then all you have to do is go in with a stopwatch in a bucket and measure the seepage. You can do the same thing with sandbags, and like here there's seepage at the toe of a dam, and uh, they were able to uh, build a monitoring point here to measure seepage at that dam. So Sean, that uh, takes us to our first break, and I, I see I'm running a little bit over, but I've got time to answer any questions that uh, come in. Great, thank you very much. As a reminder, we have now reached our first question and answer break. And Sean, I, I guess in the meantime, while uh, participants are typing in questions, um, I can start on the next uh, part. And as I see some questions come in, I can then pause and answer them. Because I, I don't see any right here at the moment. Sure thing. OK, good. Well, in this next session, let me just kind of preface what we're going to be doing. We're going to be focusing entirely on inspecting embankment dams. Now, um, before we do that, I just want to make a couple comments about maintaining dams, operating and maintaining dams. And simply, the, by being proactive and properly operating, maintaining, and inspecting a dam, it, it's a lot like taking care of an aging vehicle. And I've seen some dams that have been over 100 years old, and they look pretty much as good as the day they were built. And that's where dam owners have taken a lot of pride in maintaining those structures. And because they've spent the money um, regularly maintaining the dam, uh, they don't have costly bills associated with a deferred maintenance. On the other hand, I've seen some dams that were built only you know, 10, 20 years ago, and they're already looking at some very expensive rehabilitation costs um, because they have not been maintained very well. So if left unmaintained, excessive and expensive repair becomes necessary. Now, when you go out and do a dam inspection, it really helps to do a little bit of coordination and planning. Now, that's especially true for an annual inspection where uh, the engineer will go out and do it, but it's also true for doing the regular inspections. And I always make sure to schedule the inspection and coordinate it with the people that maintain the dam because I, I, you know, I don't want to show up and surprise them. I want to give them an opportunity to do some mowing and uh, do other maintenance. And that really helps to do the inspection as well because if you're out there and just before they do mowing, in some cases you can be facing conditions like this where the vegetation on the dam um, can grow and, and be up to five feet high. And in that case, you're, it just doesn't make it very worthwhile to do a dam inspection because there, you just won't find the, the defects. And uh, another thing is to, especially if you're new, if this is a dam that, that you've just acquired or that you've just taken responsibility to do the inspections and you're not familiar with the history behind the dam, and the first thing I would look at would be the previous inspection reports. Because what you're trying to do when you do an inspection is look for things that are changing and for changed conditions. And it's, all, it's good to look at the previous inspection reports to see what they saw and, and there may be some maintenance items that were supposed to be taken care of or, or things that need to be monitored. Uh, another thing is to look at the as-built drawings. We took just a little bit of time and looked at the, the embankment dams. And they can all look the same on the outside, but they can be different on the inside. And there are some things that are very important to know, like does it have a tow drain? And where is the tow drain? And where does it exit? How far does the tow drain extend beyond the toe of the dam? And uh, you know, other features like that, does it have instrumentation? Uh, what about operating records? And if there is instrumentation, are there readings? And it would be good to go out and look at the new readings and see how they have trended over time. And then it's also good to bring the right equipment with you so you can do a good inspection. We, I do a lot of dam inspections, and uh, this is pretty much what I pack with me whenever I do an inspection. And I want to talk just about three of the items here that I think are the most important. The first one is having a really good digital camera. And that's not just to take pictures. It, it, the cameras today, they do so much more than you know, just provide you a, a record. 
And when, when I do take pictures, it's not uncommon for me to take three to 400 pictures while doing a dam inspection at a dam. It doesn't cost any money. You can get a, a, a memory card that can hold thousands of pictures. So it's, I just take pictures all the time of, of all the features. I don't put all of them in a report. I'll put them in a directory. But it, it provides an excellent reference uh, for in the future if you want to look back and see if, if any particular part of the dam has changed. Um, most uh, good cameras have a really nice flash. And if you were to look inside an outlet conduit, all you see is a black hole. Even if you have a really good flashlight, you can't see very far inside. But a camera with a good flash can penetrate fairly far down a, a conduit. And just by taking a picture like this, it gives you a good opportunity to see what's going on uh, from the downstream end of a conduit looking inside. It also can give you access to parts of the dam that are very difficult to gain access to. Here we have a, a spillway chute. It's wet, it's slippery, and it's steep. And there's really no way you can go down there and inspect uh, parts very easily. But with the camera, you can zoom right in. And here we want to take a look at the outlet of this drain. And you can zoom in, and it shows you the condition of the concrete there, that there's some cracking going on. But more important in this case, as you zoom in, you can see that there's something going on inside this drain. It looks like there's some calcium deposits in here, or maybe some sludge. But there's something that, that would uh, merit uh, looking at this further. This is probably more than a maintenance item. This is uh, something that you may want an engineer to take a look at and see how that affects the performance of the drain. But a good camera will get you to places that, that you normally can't see. It essentially does the same thing that binoculars can do, but it also gives you a record of what you see. I always like taking a picture of the staff gauge in the reservoir so I have a record of what the reservoir level was at that time. And then when you want to inspect structures that are maybe like the tower out in the reservoir, if you're doing a regular inspection, you may not want to go out with the boat every time and take that time and, and um, access the tower. But with a good camera with a zoom lens, you can zoom right in and see all the, the parts of the tower that you really need to look at. And in this case, we're zooming right in at the water line, and we can see that the ladder going up the tower is completely corroded. And you can walk around the shoreline and continue to take pictures like this and look at the stem to see if it's deflected or if there's uh, trash accumulating uh, around the tower or anything like that. It's also good to take pictures of any measurements that you take. Here we're taking a seepage management out of a, a drain from uh, a wall at the toe of the dam. And uh, it took 21.2 seconds to fill a 500 milliliter bottle. So it's just a nice way of giving a, a physical record. Um, I, I hate taking notes and stuff when I'm out in the field. It often it'll be windy, it, it rains, you lose your pen, and when you take a, a pictures like this, it's just a nice way of collecting the data and saving it. Uh, another thing I like to take with me is a rod, and we, we this is just a normal survey rod. What we do is we cut it in half so that the uh, we have the threaded ends, and I can break it down and put it in my suitcase. But the reason I like this is whenever I take pictures. I often will include it in the pictures so that I can use it as a scale and measure uh, the length or the size of different features. Uh, you can lay it down, and when you take a picture now, you know that you know each one of these gradations on here, like the orange or the, the red part is one foot, the white is one foot. So each one of these is one foot, and that's a four foot long pole. Now I know I've got a, a two foot um, ponded water on the top of the crest of the dam here. Here we're at the toe of the dam, and uh, you can use it to probe. And I've pushed it down, and you can see we pushed down. It's very soft at the toe of this dam. There's a seepage condition there. And that helps me to illustrate that uh, what, what was going on, and that you could push this down a foot, and that was fairly soft material. Or maybe you find a rodent hole, and you're trying to probe to see how deep it is. You can see that this one's pretty deep. It's at least four feet deep. And it adds value when you take these pictures. Uh, another thing I like to take with me is uh, some good boots. I'll often just put them on and, and do the whole inspection so that I can get access to every part of the dam. Um, a lot of times when you get down to the toe of the dam, it's, it's all muddy, or there's standing water, or uh, some back water. And you want to get in and be able to see all the parts of the dam. And uh, if you don't have a good pair of boots, you, you really can't do that effectively. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, there. It, when you're doing this type of inspection, it's good to take a checklist with you. And then as you find different um, things around the dam that, that need some attention, to rate them. 
and whether or not they need to be monitored, whether or not it's some kind of uh, maintenance activity that needs to take place, or whether it needs to be investigated and you need to get an engineer involved. And if you remember, there's the fourth option, and that would be an emergency action. And that, in that case, you'd need to immediately call uh, the emergency management agency, get the state engineers involved, and uh, your engineer involved so that you can uh, address the condition as, as, and get some help and, and address it as soon as possible. So I'm going to walk you through now um, inspecting an earth embankment dam. We're going to start on the crest. That's normally where I start then go to the upstream slope, then we're going to walk down the downstream slope, and then we're going to look at the groin. And I'm going to show you a lot of examples. Some of these examples are, are really good uh, examples of what things should look like, and other examples are not so good, and some are just ugly. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. And hopefully you'll get an understanding of what the standards, what is acceptable, what, what is it that we're trying to, uh, how are we trying to maintain the dam and to what level, and, and what's the acceptable practice. Now, I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about the crest and the upstream slope than the downstream slope and the groin. It's not because those features are more important. It's just that uh, once we cover some of the things that we see on the upstream slope and the crest, it's the same thing that we're looking at at the other place, and I'm just not going to spend as much time talking about those once I cover them once. So here we have an example of a, a grass-covered earth embankment dam. And I would give this one an A+. Plus. The grass is, it, there are no bare spots. It's well maintained. There's no woody vegetation. And you could pretty much inspect this whole dam just from one location. In fact, if you take a look over to the left part of the slide, you can see that there's a slope slide right there at the outlet of the spillway. If that area was covered with tall grass or brush or trees, you probably wouldn't see that. But because this dam is so well maintained, you can see that from a distance. Now the top of a dam can have all different kinds of treatments. The last one we looked at was all grass covered, and that's probably because there's never any traffic on top of the dam. Here uh, there may be a lot of maintenance traffic or could even be an access road um, to another part uh, of a property and the owner covered it with uh, a gravel. And you can see the slopes are well maintained. This is another very good example. Other dams might have a paved crest and have a highway across the top. In that case, there are a lot more things to inspect. Um, now the pavement provides a, a really good uh, surface to inspect if you're looking for cracks or settlement or defects or things like that. But we also have some other things. We have some nice linear structures like guide rail and parapets that we should be using to help us when we inspect, do our inspection. At the other end of the spectrum, we can run into something like this. I give this an F. This, the top of the dam is not being well maintained. We have ruts and puddles. And if that continues, that can lead to some uh, problems with the embankment. It, it, it saturates the embankment because the water will seep into it, and that can induce some slope instability. It can also uh, create uh, depressions in the crest and loss of freeboard and other problems. Now here's another one. You can see that, that the, once it starts, you get soft spots because of the puddling, and uh, that can create um, problems at the top of the dam. Even paved uh, parts of the dam can have puddles and depressions. And it's good, like after a rainfall, you can go out and you can see, uh, especially on a paved um, top of dam like this, where the depressions are. And that, in a case like this, this is probably something you'd want to monitor and see if it gets worse over time. It could be um, an early indication of some settlement in the dam. Now here we have a different condition, and here we have a top of dam where we don't have uh, puddling, but what we have is a lot of ruts, and that's because there must be a lot of traffic on the top of this dam. And what that can lead to is uh, a problem when you get heavy rainfall, because it, in this case, for example, the water will accumulate on these ruts and they'll act like channels. and Normally, the, the water will flow downhill until down the, the valley and onto the dam, and then somewhere along the crest of the dam where there's a low point, it will build up like this, and then the water has no choice but to either flow down the upstream side or down the downstream side. And in that case, you can get a concentrated flow, and it can erode the vegetation and then begin eroding the dam. And there have been cases, and for example, this one, 
where the erosion was so great that it began actually to breach the dam just by that surface erosion. And you start getting a feature that's like this so that it can flow down and, and uh, erode the downstream slope. And then, then now you have loss of embankment material. And if that migrates into the uh, spillway, it can breach uh, the dam. Now, another thing that, that I've seen on the top of dam is uh, unwanted vegetation. And it's generally understood, um, without exception, that for embankment dams, there should be no trees or brush growing on the embankment. In, in this case, it was an intentional planting. And the dam owner planted trees on the top of the dam uh, to improve its aesthetics. Um, once he understood the consequences of having vegetation growing on the dam, uh, it went ahead and removed it. So the first phase was to cut it down. Now the, troops, tree, the tree roots need to be removed. And here's another example, uh, uh, an after picture when after they cut down the trees, but before there were large pine trees growing on the top of the dam, and they were deliberately planted. And here we get the other extreme, where this is a case where the dam uh, owner just stopped maintaining the dam. And we get the first stages of vegetation where you get tall grass and saplings and things like that growing. And that can eventually lead to, uh, if, if that continues, to just a forest that, uh, growing on the dam. And now we've got mature trees growing on the crest of the dam. And I, I've had some dam owners argue, well, doesn't that help the dam? Doesn't that reinforce it and make it stronger? And I guess there could be some truth to that, except that when the there are two things that can happen. One is the trees can get blown over. And if that happens, the whole root ball will get torn out uh, with the tree. And there have been cases where dams have failed because of that. And this is an example where there was a, a tree growing on top of the dam. It got blown over. And then that caused uh, the reservoir to flow through the opening and breach the dam. And you can see in this case how, how deep the roots have penetrated the um, the, the embankment of the dam. And what happens, too, is once these roots begin to decay, uh, they will form conduits and seepage paths for water to flow. So it may not be a problem while the tree is alive or immediately after you cut the stump out. But if you don't remove the tree roots, uh, you could have a problem someday in the future as they decay and uh, create a seepage path. Uh, I, also looking on the crest of the dam, we mentioned sometimes it's paved. And in this case, we have a parapet on the top of the dam. And if you look along the top of the parapet, you can see uh, it should be linear. In this case, there is a, a depression there. And I'm positive that when they built that, that was not an intentional feature. And in a case like this, that was more than just uh, something that should be monitored. And it's more than something that should just be uh, a maintenance item where we go in and raise the wall. Something like this should be escalated to a level where you get an engineer involved, and you want to know why is this happening. Obviously, something is going on in the foundation. There's some settlement or something like that. So this would be uh, an important issue that, that you'd want to get an engineer involved to find out what's going on. Now, when you have these features, it's good to um, look along them to see if they're nice and linear. Because when they were built, chances are that they were either very straight or linear. That if you start seeing offsets or things like you see here, that's an indication that there's some movement or something is going on. Now, in this case, this doesn't look too serious. It, it looks like there's a little bit of differential movement between these two um, uh, parapets. But you would want to go in and take some measurements. I, I take a picture and record the condition. And then this would be a, a good uh, deficiency that I would note, monitor this. And if you see it continuing to move, uh, then you would want to get an engineer involved and have them make an assessment of why is this uh, part of the dam moving. Here we have a guardrail. And when that was built, in this case, it was straight. And now you can see that it is sloping downhill. And you can even see some of the posts here, they're, they're, they're slanted in the downstream direction. So that could be, uh, uh, looking along these features is a good way of telling if there's anything going on with the embankment. And in this case, it's an indication that there's a vertical displacement. And that would be something that I would get an engineer to take a look at. Um, also looking for longitudinal cracks. And that would be a crack that goes along the parallel with the uh, top of the dam. It could be located on an edge like this. And that could be an indication of a slope failure about to occur. 
or, or some kind of a slope instability. It could also be located uh, right in the crest of the dam. And anything like this um, is, is more important to get an engineer involved and to have them make an assessment than to uh, just monitor it. And uh, because that, that is, is something that is indicating that there, there's something going on with the dam that really shouldn't be happening and it needs to be investigated. Uh, another kind of crack is a transverse crack. So this type of a crack is in the upstream downstream direction rather than along the length of the dam. And in many cases, this type of cracking could just be uh, drying of the top of the dam as the sun hits the, the, the uh, clay type material that the dam's made out of, it can shrink. But that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes it could be an indication of a more serious problem like differential settlement or um, or something like that, and that crack can go fairly deep so that if you had a flood and the reservoir rose, it could flow right through that crack and that could initiate uh, some very significant internal erosion and result in a piping failure. So that type of a crack, if you're able to probe it and it goes fairly deep, you'd want to get an engineer involved and have them do an investigation. Now it's also good when you're looking at the crest is to make sure that it's level. When they built the dam, Chances are it was built um, to a certain elevation and it's level from abutment to abutment. Uh, some cases, especially for very high embankment dams, they'll overbuild the center part of the dam, and that's called a camber, and they'll do that to, to account for future settlement. And so they overbuild that part that they expect to settle. Now, to see something like this, though, is, is definitely uh, not a design feature. In this case, this kind of a depression is serious. And it, what would happen is if the reservoir came up, that's where it would flow through the low, low point first, and uh, that it, you have potentially have a loss of freeboard and a decrease in spillway capacity. And that would be something that would be a maintenance item where you'd want to raise that if it was minor. If it was major and you thought it was associated with settlement or something else, then you'd want to get an engineer involved and have them help you determine why and, and to fix it. Now, another uh, place where that can occur is where you have an embankment and then it is a composite structure where the embankment meets another structure like a, a spillway wall or, or something like that. And, and that's a place where you want to take a look at where these two structures meet because oftentimes we can have a lot of traffic there. You could have some animal traffic or pedestrian traffic. And just over the years and over uh, a long period of time, um, that area can be worn down or eroded. And in this case, it's as much as a foot and a half. So if we were to take another perspective at that, the top of the embankment dam is really the same height, or it was originally the same height as the top of this concrete wall. But over time, this area got worn down. And um, that would be a maintenance item. And now here, the dam owner, once they found out about this, they went in and did some maintenance, and they brought the top of dam up to the top of the wall so that there wasn't a low point. Another thing to look for is animal activity, in, in particular rodent type activity or any kind of animal that will want to dig a burrow into the dam. I was inspecting this one dam or levee um, and I came across one zone where there are all these penetrations in the top and I, I saw a lot of groundhog activity. So I took a pad of paper I had and I rolled up, I, I pulled off pages of paper and I stuck it in each hole and when I was done walking this 50 foot uh, section of the embankment, I, I had identified 13 penetrations. And uh, on another project, I, uh, where there was a failure associated with um, rodent activity, um, they went in and they pumped in an expanding foam grout in some of the holes to see where it came out. And they, they put a color dye in it as well. And then they excavated a cross section and they found uh, an advanced network of trails and uh, rooms and chambers inside the, uh, the, the dam. And uh, groundhogs will do this. They, they, they see it's a perfect habitat for them. They've got all this nice uh, soft embankment material to dig into. They've got access to wonderful food supply because it's a nice mowed uh, grass. And they've got water, so it's kind of uh, groundhog heaven. And they may be working on the downstream side. And then on the upstream side, you can have muskrats burrowing in. And then you can see what happens right here. There's a very small gap between these burrows. And when the water comes up, 
it can flow through, and then you have a piping failure, and that erosion, once it starts, um, it can happen very quickly. And dams have failed uh, where there's been a lot of animal activity at the dam. Most of the time, it's at the crest of the dam at the top where the, the embankment is fairly narrow and not so much at the bottom, especially for big dams where it's very fat and you're less likely to get that kind of a connection. But it's very important to take care of uh, animal activity like that. And the most effective approach is to control the population so that it doesn't happen in the first place. But once it does happen, if it's extensive like I just showed you, that's pretty much a rebuild. You need to go in and um, rebuild that part of the embankment. If it's minor and shallow, you can often just uh, fill it in with a sand slurry and compact it. But uh, you get on it early before it becomes a real problem. Uh, another problem that you might see is a cave-in in the crest. That is a, a much more serious condition. That's not something that you should go in and fill in yourself. If you see something like that, you should call your engineer to have them find out what's going on. And that could escalate to something even more serious like this. If you see something like this, um, approach it with great caution, um, you know, safety first always. And this is a case where you would want to get your uh, emergency management agency involved. If you have an emergency action plan, you would uh, use that to begin notifying the appropriate people. Definitely get the state engineers uh, involved and get as much help as you can in resolving this problem as quickly and as safely as possible. And then um, there's animal activity on the dam, including the crest of the dam. And just over time, they can wear out down the vegetation and create paths and low points in the crest of the dam. So we spent a lot of time on the crest of the dam. Now, a lot of that stuff applies to every part of the dam. So we're going to speed it up a little bit more. But we're going to go to the upstream slope. And on the upstream slope, here we have a really good, well-maintained slope. It's all grass uh, covered, it's mowed, there's no woody vegetation, so that, that's a good example. Um, other dams, the last one was a flood control dam, so it rarely saw water up the slope, and that, that, that was a, a good way to protect it. Other dams where maybe the water level fluctuates um, up and down the slope on a more regular basis, they can be armored with different materials. Here we have a carefully placed uh, rock fill material on the embankment. And whenever you inspect the upstream slope, here we have a dumped riprap, I always like to walk down to the water's edge and then look right along the water's edge. And that line of sight should be very linear and uniform. It shouldn't be going in and out. If there was a bulge in the embankment or something like that, this is a good way to find out if that's occurring. It's just looking along the water line. Now, maybe a deficiency you see here is you can see there's some woody vegetation growing. That would be good to get that off. Um, another type of protection is hand place riprap. A lot of the older dams have this. It's very beautiful. It's very expensive to put on, but it's the same thing. You're looking, you'd be looking for any missing stones, and then when you're along the water's edge, you're looking to make sure that there's no bulging in the embankment or um, slope instability or anything like that. And then you can see here is an example of a grass-lined upstream slope, and it's not linear. So something is going on here. And in this case, it's probably because of wave action and it's eroding the upstream slope and it's creating this irregular surface. That's probably because it's, it's persistent all the way along there. That's probably what's going on. And if it goes on and on, now you start uh, having problems where you get scarps and uh, some fairly high erosion and that can lead to uh, slope instability. And the longer you let this go, uh, the more expensive it gets to repair, and eventually it can become a dam safety problem. And here you can see one that's gone pretty far, and it's uh, creating some slope instability and e some fairly significant erosion along the upstream slope. Even if you have a riprap armoring, what you're looking for there is to make sure that it is uh, not broken down or weathered. Some rock fill will wear, wear out over time it was free saw cycles and things like that. Uh, most often, though, it's just because of uh, kids and, and fishermen um, just throwing stuff, uh, riprap, into the reservoir. And you want to make sure that it's sized right and that, that um, it's doing the job. Uh, another thing that's often found is that when the riprap or the rock fill, the riprap is, by the way, is just uh, another name for rock fill. It's a term often used to uh, designate that rock fill that's placed on the upstream slope. But if it's not placed correctly, 
For example, in this case, you can see there's a lot of movement of the riprap, and there's some bare um, uh, embankment exposed on the top. And what probably happened here is that this did not have bedding material or filter fabric underneath of it, so that when the waves came up and sloshed over this, it eroded the fill material underneath, and that created this uh, effect called beaching. And that's what you'll see there. Now, there are some parts of the country where they don't have rock fill available to put on upstream slopes to provide erosion protection. And especially in Florida, they'll use uh, available on-site material, and it's off, often a sandy soil. And they'll mix it with cement, and then they'll place it on um, on, as, like sheets on the upstream slope and compact it, and that's called soil cement. And that can be a very effective way of providing uh, slope protection. But you still need to inspect it. And when I do that, I normally walk along and I'll tap it with my rod, uh, looking for uh, areas where there are hollow spots. That's often referred to as drummy concrete because you can hear it. You can be tapping along and you can hear it solid, and then all of a sudden you hear parts where it sounds like a drum, and that's probably because it's hollow underneath. In this case, is obviously there's a problem here. It's gotten to the point where it's collapsed, and that, that can be a, a more serious problem. And you want to get an engineer involved in a case like that. Now getting up to things that are escalated to the level of an emergency. If you were inspecting the upstream slope and you saw a sinkhole with concentrated flow like this, that would be uh, contact your state representatives, your emergency managers, and your engineers. In some cases, you may look out in the reservoir. and when you're inspecting the upstream slope, you don't just inspect the part you can see above the water. You're also looking into the water as much as possible to see if there's any evidence of something going on there as well. And if you do that, you may see uh, a vortex like this. Now, this could be a very serious problem, or it could be a normal condition. In this case, there was an intake at that location underneath this vortex. And when they opened it up to release water, they created this condition. But if there wasn't a structure like there and it was just the upstream slope, that could be an indication that there's internal erosion going on and uh, it, it, it could be uh, something that is an emergency condition. For example, here we're walking along the upstream slope of this dam and we looked in on along the upstream slope and we saw this void with a vortex. So this is a sinkhole and this is a very serious condition. You'd want to lower the reservoir in a controlled manner as quickly as possible and as safely as possible and make sure to call uh, the dam safety reps and emergency responders to help out with that. Also, uh, having unwanted vegetation. Here we have trees growing on the upstream slope. As I mentioned earlier, there should be no woody vegetation. If the owner would have gotten on this early, it would have been a matter of just pulling it out or cutting it down, and now he uh, or she has to deal with the root system that's grown in the embankment as well. So no trees or obscuring vegetation on the upstream slope. Most often you'll see something like this, where it's very easy to mow and maintain the crest and the upstream and downstream slope of the dam, and it's really hard to get at that uh, interface right where the water meets the slope because the, the equipment can't get down in there. It's often wet and uh, you don't have good traction. So that gets neglected and then we'll get this tall vegetation growing there. But, but that needs to be removed as well. And it's absolutely amazing how fast vegetation can grow, um, even through uh, things like uh, soil cement or in this case, hand place riprap. This particular dam, here's a picture of it back in 1979. And then this is a picture about uh, 20 to 25 years later. And you can see we have large trees with two to three foot diameters with root systems growing through there. And if, if this dam, this dam, by the way, um, this picture here was taken after 100 years of operation of this dam, uh, then it, the ownership changed. And uh, then we had trees growing on it within a few years. And now, now it's a major rehabilitation problem. Just like with the upstream, the top of the dam, we're looking for rodent holes and any rodent activity, and that can occur anywhere on the dam. And then looking for slope instability or any evidence of that. So here we have cracks, longitudinal cracks, and uh, slides and slumps or slips in the upstream slope. Um, now we're going to move down to the downstream slope. And here we have a, a beautifully maintained uh, downstream slope of a dam, just like a golf course. So they, they get an A-plus for this. Notice that there's uh, no trees. And what we're trying to do is create an exclusion zone for any trees growing on the footprint of the dam. And that should extend a minimum of 20 feet beyond the toe of the dam. 
Here's another uh, good example of a well-maintained dam. Uh, in, in this case, there's no trees anywhere near the downstream toe, and that's excellent. Uh, that's especially important when we start inspecting toe drains and things like that, because the owners will often forget that if the tree is growing along the toe of the dam, chances are that root system is looking for water, and the toe drain system is a great place to find it, and that, that can create a real problem and clog the drain system. You know, here's an example of an F. The, uh, the downstream slope has not been um, maintained, and we have, essentially have a force growing on there, and that's obscuring um, any observations and creating all kinds of other problems. In fact, this is that same one. We're down at the toe of the dam. We're looking at the outlet conduit right here, and I can guarantee you that this tree roots are, are is, as far as this corrugated metal pipe goes, they're penetrating, trying to penetrate that and uh, find water, and that just creates all kinds of problems. You can have the opposite uh, problem as well, and that is not enough vegetation growing on the slope. And in this case, you know, the, the owner is trying to uh, provide a grass cover, and it's not taking, and whenever it rains, we start getting erosion gullies, and that, that just creates a real problem. Uh, the reason could be that the slope is too steep, but more often, it's because the uh, soil is just not uh, uh, the, treated properly to ha sustain a grass cover. And I, I've, in most cases, will recommend to the dam owner that they contact their county agricultural cooperative to, and take a couple of samples of the soil and send it to them. And then they'll send back a report card indicating what treatment uh, should be applied to the uh, top of the soil. Oftentimes, it's just a matter of the right balance of nitrogen, uh, phosphate, and potassium. And I, I've seen within just a few days of application of the right um, fertilizer, uh, an excellent grass cover being established, just night and day difference. Also looking for rodent activity, just like on the crest and the upstream slope. Looking for some other things, though. Now we're looking for slides and slu slumps. This is uh, more important on the downstream side because it can often be associated with uh, a change in the seepage condition. And if it's a big, sometimes it's just on the surface. It could be a shallow um, instability, but this is a much deeper instability. And if you saw something like this, uh, this would be more of an emergency condition where you need to contact the state engineers and your dam um, engineer and they'd want to investigate this. You'd probably be lowering the reservoir and trying to figure out why did this happen. This, is, this would be well beyond uh, trying to repair or maintain yourself. Here is another example. You can see that this one was so significant, the instability, that we begin losing some of the crests of the dam, and that, that can really compromise the integrity of the dam and uh, result in a very rapid, uncontrolled release of water. And sometimes when you're inspecting the dam or you're mowing it, you, you may come across something. In this case, it's a bulge. It wasn't there before. And that's an indication that there's something going on in the embankment. And in this case, it led to an eventual deep-seated failure of the embankment. And if you can catch this early, uh, you can prevent a, a much more expensive um, repair. Or even better, uh, you can prevent a catastrophic failure of the dam. Now, let's say you were inspecting this embankment. Uh, the, do you see anything unusual here? And this is another case where you look at um, other features and see if you see anything unusual. And uh, if you look at this long enough, you may begin to see that, look at that pole. That's kind of tilting. And that could be a coincidence that one pole is tilting. But when you start seeing one there and another one here, and then these ball is, and they're all tilting in the same direction, Chances are they were not installed like that, because you can see this ball there was vertical, and there were other features here that are vertical. You know, you can use this as evidence to help uh, indicate whether or not there is a slope movement or a problem developing. And the one place that uh, on the embankment that I really slow down and I, I really take a lot of time looking for any kind of changes is where there's a penetration through the embankment. Most of the time it's where the outlet conduit uh, or the conduit penetrates the embankment. You stand, I often will stand on the crest of the dam, I'll line up where the intake tower is or the inlet and look at where the outlet is, and then I'll look at the upstream slope, the crest, and the downstream slope looking for any problems. And in this case, there is a problem right there. 
and if we take a close-up of that, it's a sinkhole. And the fact that it's in line with the conduit is, is probably not a coincidence. It, the two are linked together, and uh, that's often where we'll have a problem. This is a bigger problem here. If you see something like this, it's, it's not a maintenance item where that you just go in and backfill. This is something where you would want to get your engineer involved and uh, have them figure out what's going on and uh, address that problem. Now, when I originally put this presentation together, I had about 40 slides just like this one of all different kinds of dams just because I wanted to impress on everyone that if a dam is going to fail by piping or seepage, chances are it's going to fail where there's a penetration like a conduit. And that, that's another reason to spend a lot of time looking. But for time's sake, I took them all out. I just put one in here. But um, that is the most important uh, area to examine if you're looking for seepage. Uh, there are other sources of seepage. So here, th there's seepage all over this embankment. And this is, uh, would be an emergency condition where you'd need to, again, get the state engineers involved and uh, begin lowering the reservoir. And this is another one. This may not be widespread. It, it could be a concentrated seepage at one location. And the one characteristic about this seepage that makes it an emergency is the color. You can see that it's muddy water. And that's an indication that along with the seepage, there is material from the embankment that's being eroded. If, if you see clear seepage, um, that's one thing. And that, that may not be an emergency condition. But if you see muddy seepage coming out of the embankment like this, this is definitely an emergency condition. And the state engineer would need to be notified. And you, you, you need to take um, immediate action on that. And here's another example of seepage. At this dam, the, the toe of the dam was dry. And then uh, all of a sudden, seepage condition developed here. And it, sometimes it can have a trampoline effect so that when you walk down on here and you walk on it, it's kind of like walking on very soft material. And it's spongy and it acts like a trampoline. You need to be very careful when you inspect something like this. I had one colleague that walked out on something like this and sank down immediately uh, almost to chest high because it can be like a quick condition. And it's another reason why you want to keep the toe of the dam clear of any trees and brush and vegetation so that if something like this developed, you'd be able to see it. This would be uh, another, um, depending upon the size and the extent, uh, you, you may want to get your engineer involved. And if it was more significant and it was changing and rapidly developing, then it would escalate into an emergency condition. And it could be uh, not just on the toe of the dam. It could be up the slope of the dam. And uh, you should be looking at the vegetation to help you see if there's anything going on. Sometimes the seepage is so small that uh, it's not, you cannot visibly see it flowing like a stream of water. It may just be a wet area on the dam. And in that case, the color of the vegetation or the type of vegetation can be a good indication to help you find if there's a change condition or where seepage is occurring. On this dam, we're late in the summer. And the grass is all turning brown, except for the one part that's getting a lot of water. And that helps you see where that water, the seepage, is coming from. Um, and here is an example where it's even more concentrated. And in this case, the uh, zone here was so wet that the um, maintenance operators who were doing the mowing, uh, it was so wet that they couldn't mow on it without sliding around and sinking into it. So the vegetation can be a good indication if there's a problem. And look for that when you're inspecting the downstream slope. Looking for damage to the embankment, here we, have, uh, we can have livestock going up and down or ATV traffic. And that can result in gullies. And when it rains, it can get worse. Or the worst case would be if there's actually a depression in the top. And then if the dam got over top, um, the grass lining, which is the first line of defense, is gone. And it would just erode, and it would breach at that location. Looking at the groins of the dam is important. That's where the embankment makes contact with the natural terrain. And uh, there's a lot going on there. And if seepage develops there, you know, that, that can be a serious condition. And I just put in an example of probably the worst dam failure ever that occurred because of uh, seepage at the groin. And that was the Teton Dam failure in Idaho back in 1976. It started off with clear seepage. And then within a few minutes, it rapidly developed into muddy seepage. And you can see it over here at, at the abutment. 
And just within minutes, it began to get larger and larger. You can see the embankment material being washed out, and then it collapsed. And now we've got uh, the reservoir flowing through and overtopping that the remaining part of the dam, and that grows. And this is really uh, an absolutely an emergency condition. And this particular dam failure resulted in billions of dollars of damage and a loss of, uh, I believe, a, uh, only about 14 people died. And I say only because the community that was inundated downstream was very large. Uh, you know, thousands of people lived downstream. Um, also going beyond the dam, you know, the, the groin of the dam is right here. And here we have seepage exiting someplace downstream. Sometimes you'll see boils and concentrated seepage. So that's also something that should be observed. In this case, it was at beyond the toe of the dam in the flat area, and there was a boil that was observed there. And that wasn't necessarily seepage through the embankment, but through and underneath the foundation, like you see here in this little um, sketch. And, and something like that, if you saw a boil like that, that would be an an emergency uh, condition where you'd want to alert the uh, state engineers and have that investigated as well by your engineer. And then lastly, looking at the groins of the dam, and that's a place where the flow will often concentrate from runoff and you can get some erosion. Here they're using masonry. More common, it's just uh, dumped riprap. And you can, you can, it can be just a grass lining if it's well maintained, but if that concentrated flow is too great, you can start getting erosion like this. And that takes us to uh, our next break. And I see we've got about six minutes for some questions. And I, I have some questions here this time. So I'm going to start. And uh, you can start typing in other questions too, right, Sean? Yep, you can enter in questions at any time. OK. It says, you have mentioned about the three types of inspection, routine, regular, and annual. But how often do you recommend carrying out comprehensive inspection? Well. Um, Comprehensive inspections are relatively new things. There are some agencies like FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that have been more aggressive than some state uh, regulated dams at requiring these. And it may be just a matter of time. But um, I think what the, um, the person that posed that question is an excellent question, is that it's good practice every once in a while um, to do a a, a top a, a inspection that, that goes beyond just kicking the tires and looking at everything, but actually looking at the design drawings and uh, doing a failure modes analysis and looking at the hydrology and the slope stability calculations and the whole structure, how it's being operated, maintained in the history, and looking to see if it meets current design standards. Because a lot of older dams may not have those features. And often with a very small investment, you can improve the stability and buy down risk uh, associated with that dam. And it's a hard question to answer, how frequent? I know the Fish and Wildlife Service does it every six years. And that's probably the most frequent that I've seen. I'm not exactly sure about FERC. I think it's about the same. All right, uh, why don't we move on to the next presentation there? I think I've got all of the, uh, the questions that were in there. OK, good. Well, we're, we're down to our, our last 34 minutes, and uh, we're right on schedule. And uh, now, now we're going to talk about inspecting the rest in the other parts of the dam. That includes inspecting the spillways, the outlet works, and the conduit, and then the drains at the dam. And that, those are the things that we're going to focus on. Um, here we have a spillway. If you were inspecting the spillway, what would you be looking for? And what would you see that, that was wrong with it? Well, a lot of times it's not immediately obvious. This spillway was built in the 1960s, and whenever I inspect a spillway that, 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 that is that old, I like to look at the drawings. And what I look at is all these slabs and the joint of the slabs, I want to see how they were treated. Because a lot of the early dams, they did not have water stops in the joints. And what a water stop is, it could be a metal, um, a piece of metal that's folded so that as the slabs expand and contract, it prevents the water from going through the joints. Or it could be a, a PVC, polyvinyl chloride, or rubber type material that spans the joint and that's embedded in both sides of the slab. And as the slab moves, it also prevents water. But a lot of the early dams don't have that. And they may have some uh, tar or bituminous material that was poured in that's now dried out and, and gone. And when water flows over the spillway, it can enter into the slabs and cracks of the joint 
and then it can erode material under the spillway. So when I inspect a spillway like this, I like to tap on it, looking for that drummy concrete. And uh, unfortunately, I, I can't uh, replicate the sound for you, what that might sound like, because we don't have the ability to do that. But in this case, we, were, we found voids under the slab, and the solution was to go in and to do repairs. And uh, sure enough, there were large voids, and you could see these cavities under the slab. And it's good to detect these now, because if you don't, uh, you can have a more serious condition like this, where the dam essentially breached underneath the spillway. You can walk right underneath of it and right up into the reservoir because of the erosion and the seepage that occurred underneath the spillway. Or, or like this one here. In this case, you know, the concrete is in excellent condition. There's, there's no spalling, there's no cracking, but if the um, seepage underneath the spillway advances to a point where it loses intimate contact with the foundation, it's just a matter of time and uh, you develop either internal erosion to the point where the reservoir just uh, breaches underneath the spillway or the, the uh, spillway collapses. So that's important to inspect when you're looking at spillways. Uh, another thing to look at, here we have a side channel spillway. Note that there's no water going over the spillway, but as you inspect this, you see seepage going through the spillway, um, side slabs and the bottom of the slab, and in fact it's seeping at a very high level here. That means the water level on the other side of the slab goes all the way up to the exit point. And it, you can do the math, it, that means that there's a, a tremendous uplift force underneath uh, this concrete, and that should not be occurring. That, that's a serious condition that you should get your engineer looking at. In fact, here we are fairly downstream of the crest, and we can see water um, up the side slope of this spillway. And, and if you looked at the uh, design documents on this spillway, you would see that there was a drain underneath the slab. But why is water way up here? Um, this is a cause to do some investigations to see if that drain is clogged or if the capacity of the drain is being exceeded. But th this is, could be a serious problem because it could lead to something like this. Now the seepage under the slab has gotten to the point where the pressure is so great that it actually lifted up the slab. And again, look at what color the seepage is. It's brown. That means that material is being eroded underneath the, the spillway and it's an uncontrolled release of water. It's, it's leading to a failure of the dam, and this is an emergency condition. Another thing to look for is, like anything, um, it just things deteriorate over time by being exposed to the elements. So here we have a corner of a piece of concrete, and it's weathered, and we start seeing the uh, reinforcing steel being exposed. And that, that's important that you do some maintenance on this very quickly because when the reinforcing steel is exposed, it will corrode. When it corrodes, it swells. When it swells, it deteriorates the concrete. So here we have a picture of uh, that condition in 2006. Now three years later in 2009, you can see how it's beginning to deteriorate at an accelerated rate. Had the owner gotten on this very early, it would have been a minor repair. Now we're looking at a much more expensive repair. There are other kinds of problems that you might see too. Here we have extensive cracking of the concrete. In this case, if we, we got the concrete sampled and tested, and it turned out to be an alkali aggregate reaction. In other words, the aggregate that was used in the cement um, was not compatible with the cement, and you start getting this alkali gel. And what that does is it causes the concrete to grow, and it begins to expand and expand. And in some cases, that's not a big deal. But in other cases, if this is, is uh, pretty advanced, it'll start, cause uh, walls to start swelling, and then gates no longer work, um, conduits begin to crack, and you can have other problems. Here's an example of a spillway, a concrete spillway. That's pretty old, but you can see very little maintenance has been done to it. Now we've got spalled concrete. We have vegetation growing in the joints. We have seepage. You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on here. Uh, this is probably a complete rebuild because of deferred maintenance. When vegetation uh, takes root, this started off as a little sapling in a little crack, probably in a mortar joint, and it wasn't taken care of, and now it's at a point where it's causing significant destructive damage, and it's, it's much more expensive than had it been taken care of when it was just a little sapling. Other things to look for is movement in walls and things like that. Here you can see that this wall is tilting out. You can see the, a top photo here. 
Uh, if it's just a little bit, you may want to measure it and then bring it to the attention of an engineer. If it looks like it's something that's changing fairly rapidly, um, it's something you'd want to get a state engineer involved in and, and treat it more like an emergency condition, depending upon what it was and where it was located. Here we have a uh, concrete surface on the spillway training wall. And it's just uh, a, a case where the concrete is aging, it's being exposed to a lot of freeze-thaw cycles, and the surface is deteriorating. In a case like this, it can be repaired. There's some excellent concrete repair materials and methods where you can go in and clean it off, sometimes down to the rebar, put on a, um, a steel mesh, and then use gunite or a polymer modified concrete and restore the surface and extend the life of the wall. If you let it go too far, the concrete just rots, it absorbs moisture, and then it accelerates, deteriorates at an accelerated rate. Here's another example of a strut where the purpose of the strut was to keep the walls separated and brace them, and now the walls are the only thing holding it up. So, you know, inspect that. Another thing that, that happens at spillways is erosion. When this spillway was designed, you can see it's, uh, it was excavated in rock, and then they lined the crest of uh, the control section with concrete, and that's what it looked like when it was built. And then later, you can see what happened. The, even the rock eroded because of the erosive forces of the flow going through the spillway. So this is something to monitor, and if it becomes extensive like this, uh, now we've got an expensive repair. Sometimes if it catches early, you can put an appropriate armoring um, material or extend the concrete and prevent this from happening. But that's something to watch for. In a lot of um, these earth cut or grass line spillways, um, the designer intended them to be maintained with a very healthy grass cover because that is the primary erosion protection for these spillways. In this case, you can see the owner allowed trees to grow in the spillway. You can see them growing on the embankment. And that's often a concentration point for uh, flow, and that will accelerate the erosion in the spillway, create a, a head cut point, and then it will begin to migrate like this right up. And it gets worse and worse as the flow continues, because now you get a, a waterfall and a head cut condition, and it will migrate. This one was 40 feet deep until it went right through and breached the embankment. I just want to show you some things to look for when you're inspecting a grass-lined spillway. Uh, if you see a tire ruts like this, that, that especially parallel with the direction of the flow, um, that could be significant. And uh, that would need to be main, that'd be a maintenance item where you'd want to get on that, prevent the traffic, and um, plant more grass. Here's an example of a dam that failed, and it breached right through the spillway. And in fact, this, this meandering path that you see here was the dirt road that went right through the spillway. The flow over the grass line part of it kept that spillway protected. But where that dirt was exposed, that's where it eroded. And uh, you just need to be aware of the, um, that condition. Here, just to show you what happens when you allow saplings and woody vegetation to grow in a grass line spillway, you can see the flow, how it just targets these obstructions. And you get a lot more turbulence there than you do at other places where you just have the grass cover. So here we have uh, a case where the spillway was let overgrown with some woody uh, brush. And then when it was activated, you can see the damage that occurred all around these relatively small uh, brush type features. Other things to look for are unintended modifications. Here we have the crest of the spillway, which is really important because that's what controls the flow and how much flow and the discharge capacity of the spillway. And in this case, a local farmer was using the top of dam to get access to his fields on the other side. And he was having trouble getting over the crest. So we built a ramp right there. And by doing that, he filled in a significant part of the spillway. And by diminishing the spillway capacity during a flood now, it won't have the capacity it needs. Another unintended modification that uh, I've seen is where we'll have a grass line spillway like this one. And it's got that nice grass lining. And it's supposed to go all the way down to the valley bottom. And at some point uh, during the life of the dam, the, uh, someone built a road and, uh, right, where the, right through the spillway. And now we have ba basically a head cut or a drop off point there. And if you can imagine what the flow is going to look like when it flows down there, well, that, this is what it's going to look like. You can see the flow in the spillway here is nice and relatively calm. You don't see any turbulence or anything like that. And that's because the grass lining is providing the protection. 
But once it starts going down, you can see it's all muddy and turbulent, and it's scouring and washing the trees off, and it begins to head cut upstream until you get something like this, and you can get a complete breach uh, through that spillway that, that, that was meant to have that grass lining to protect it. In this case, this is exactly what happened. It was a road that was cut through the grass line spillway, and that was the initiation point for the um, uh, failure. And engineers have analyzed this particular case and determined that it would not have failed if that had not happened. One of the things that I'm so surprised about in this particular case is that the spillway flow only lasted 23 hours with a maximum depth of about 5 feet. And during that time, 190,000 cubic yards of material was eroded to create this breach. That's the equivalent of almost 20,000 truckloads of fill material. So the erosive um, forces of water it can be amazing. Something else that you look for, especially on spillways and intake structures, is to make sure that the trash racks are not obstructed. Because if they are clogged, that diminishes the conveyance capacity, and that can lead to overtopping of the dam. Here we have a nice structure. There's no obstruction, but you can see, yes, look for the trash racks to make sure they're doing their job. And in that case, there was missing a, a central bar here. Not a big deal. That would be a maintenance item that you need to go in and fix. This is more serious. This is uh, a case where the over time, the trash rack corroded, and essentially as if it's almost not there, we've got a clear opening. And this is, if, if uh, floating debris and stuff were to enter into the conduit, it could create a real nightmare for the dam owner to try and open that up. Um, oftentimes, these trash racks are submerged, and you need to do some underwater inspection to do that. The other problem with trash racks is if they're not properly sized. Uh, in this case, the dam owner made some modifications, and they put grating on top. And it's very small grating, about one inch openings, so that whenever the smallest materials, like leaves and twigs, try to flow into the riser structure, it, it, they get clogged up, and it becomes a very difficult maintenance item, and, and the trash racks aren't, are not doing what they're intended to do. In general, the opening should be about four inches by four inches. Uh, here we have a, a drop structure, and uh, it's actually intended to have this covering on top. There's really not too much wrong, but the reason I showed this picture is when you're looking at these structures, you need to look at all parts of the structure. In this case, uh, there was some, uh, uh, a population of beavers that got very busy, and they began to take uh, branches and stuff from the downstream side and run them up through the conduit and fill up the spillway tower from the downstream side. So that's a good reason when you're doing inspections to do a thorough inspection and look at all parts. Uh, here is an example of an auxiliary spillway. And at some point, the owner decided to um, improve the security at the site by putting in a chain link fence and preventing trespassers from coming on. And then uh, debris started growing over it. And now, not debris, but uh, vegetation. Now you've got a problem with the conveyance capacity. This is a case. There is a spillway in there somewhere. It's just a case where um, it was not maintained anymore. In some cases, they forget about it. These auxiliary spillways can be sometimes located off beyond an abutment and uh, neglected and not maintained. And in this case, uh, the conveyance capacity would be diminished because of it's all filled with debris. Just a couple words about safety. Um, if you're inspecting a principal spillway or a riser structure like this, it is, you, need, you need to recognize that it is a confined space. And that, that's a job that's probably best left to the experts unless your staff have confined space entry training. There are documented cases where inspectors and, and maintenance uh, people have tried to enter and they slipped and they've lost their life um, by falling to the bottom. Uh, another issue in confined spaces, and this is especially true in manholes and drain systems and things like that, where uh, there can be other hazards. And all of these, it's very good uh, as a dam owner to label all of these features so that uh, the maintenance staff and other people that may want to access it know of the hazards that may exist. It's OK to open the top as long as you don't enter into that space uh, and take measurements or do something like that. But before you enter it, uh, you need to be aware of the hazards. And there are cases, this is probably, uh, I have a couple of examples like this. This is where uh, the Army Corps of Engineers had two interns working for them, two young men. Uh, they went out to this dam 
to uh, do some inspection work, and they opened up the top of the manhole. One of them entered in, and he was asphyxiated, and another one, the other young man went in to, to try to rescue him, and then he succumbed. And the reason was uh, there was some maintenance work that was being done uh, nearby, uh, and it, it was a gas-powered uh, motor that was running, and the exhaust uh, accumulated in the bottom of this, uh, manhole, and so the atmosphere was toxic. So whenever you do inspect or, or go in and do maintenance on a facility like this, you need to te check the atmosphere, test it. If it needs to be ventilated, to ventilate it. And if somebody does enter, they need to use the right equipment and the right procedures, and you need a plan to do this. Um, sometimes you can enter a conduit and do a manned inspection. You need to recognize, though, that that is confined space and it needs to be handled the same way as what we just discussed. Uh, I, I tend to not uh, recommend doing any kind of conduit inspection like what you see here. Um, I, I won't go into anything that's less than 48 inches in diameter. I've heard of people entering conduits as low as 24 inches in diameter. Uh, I think that's too hazardous. We have far um, too good equipment now to do kind that kind of uh, combined, that kind of inspection. We can use ROVs. You never know what you're going to find in there. You can find obstructions. Uh, you can find critters and other things in there. And um, just safety first. Um, for most conduit inspections, less than 48 inches in diameter, um, you can very economically. Do, you do it by ROV, and I think it does a far better job because you get a complete video. It, it tells you where you are. You can drive up and down. You can stop at joints, do a 360 pan, and zoom in and zoom out and get a good record of, of what the conduit really looks like. I imagine this inspector uh, got a big surprise when he was inspecting inside this conduit. He failed to do a lockout and tag out so that he didn't coordinate this inspection activity with people that were operating the dam. I think just by studying this picture, you can see that this exit probably was not very well planned, and uh, he was in for a big surprise. So again, be safe when you inspect. Now, if you do inspect a conduit and you do a manned entry, what are you looking for? Uh, if it's a conduit with joints, you'll want to inspect every joint and see if there's any joint movement. If there is movement, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, a lot of joints have, can tolerate a lot of movement. Uh, but what's important, though, is to correlate that with what does it look, that joint actually look like, and is there still a good seal um, with that joint? If you see something like this where the joints are open, that is serious, and that needs to be addressed um, by an engineer. Other things to look for are structural defects, like maybe a cracking of the conduit or deterioration. If you see seepage in the joints, you can see here this is uh, pressure uh, seepage going in. It's clear. But this is a very serious condition, and this is something that you'd want an engineer to look at. There should never be any seepage in the joints of a conduit, certainly not like this. What could be even worse is if the seepage coming in is carrying embankment material right through the joint. Um, that is really serious because now you're getting voids on the other side. The seepage can be expected to increase. Oftentimes, you won't find this evidence because it's being washed through the conduit as fast as it's coming in. But this, this is a, a serious uh, uh, condition. Um, the rule of thumb nowadays is never build a, a conduit using corrugated metal pipe. There were a lot of these used because they were so economical. That is not the place to save money. And we've learned that they have a very short life, uh, probably 25 years, sometimes up to 50 years. But they do corrode over time. And here you can see the bottom of this one is gone. So it's, now we just have erodible material underneath. Many dams have failed because of corrosion and the seepage through that type of a conduit. On that particular dam, they pulled the conduit out, turned it over, and you could see that that was the reason why it failed at that embankment. The other thing to look for is that the outlet, there should be no tailwater up against the conduit under normal flow conditions. During a flood, yes, the backwater would be higher. But during normal flow conditions, this outlet conduit should not be submerged in the drain. There should be no backwater going through the drains. This is not the way it was designed. This would be caused to go downstream and see if there's any silt buildup or obstructions or maybe a beaver dam or something like that, because there should be no water backing through that system. Here's the opposite. 
Uh, in this case, uh, there's too much scour and erosion at the outlet of this conduit and it's beginning to impact the uh, stability of the embankment. And in that case, uh, the, you'd want to make sure that it was armored and protected so that that didn't occur. Now, last, we're going to talk about inspecting the drainage system of an embankment dam. And this is a cutaway. So we looked at the principal spillway conduit and the spillways. Now, uh, here we have a modern dam, and it's got a chimney drain that will collect any seepage that goes through the clay core. And then any seepage that comes up through the foundation will be picked up in this blanket drain. And that's, uh, these are all kind of sandy gravel materials that are specially designed to collect and uh, transmit the seepage. And that will get transmitted down to the toe of the dam into a, a toe trench that has similar material. And then it often will have a perforated pipe in, in the bottom of the toe trench to collect all that seepage. And then that gets conveyed to uh, a discharge point. If it's a very long uh, conduit, you'll have these uh, manholes in there so that you can have access to do inspection and cleaning of the drainage system. Now, every modern drainage system, uh, and this is fairly recent practice. A lot of older dams don't have this, but every uh, drainage system really should have this. And that is the, the conduit in the tow drain should actually have a clean out at the upstream end, not the outlet, but at the other end, the highest end, so that there is access from both ends. And here's an example of one of those clean outs where you can open the top and uh, then have access to the conduit, take it off, you can inspect it, and if, it need, if it's full of debris, you can flush it. A common thing that occurs is the accumulation of uh, a precipitate so that as the groundwater or the seepage water comes in contact with the atmosphere, um, some of the uh, iron bacteria stuff will uh, precipitate and it will build up in there and it needs to be uh, flushed out. The other thing that can happen is the conduits are made out of corrugated metal pipe or something like that and they corrode and begin to collapse or um, you have animal and rodent activity using them as a, a dwelling place and filling them up with stuff. And uh, like all parts of the dam, they need to be maintained. And if they're um, clogged up, you can get in and water jet them out and clean them out. And they can also be inspected. And instead of using an ROV or a self-propelled crawler type camera, you, they're often so small that you need a push camera which is a camera with a lighted end, and then it has a, a rigid, uh, semi-rigid um, cable that you can just push it through and inspect it. The kind of things that you might see is a structural failure of the uh, drainage conduit, or in this case, it's a complete failure. And now embankment material is actually being washed in, drain material is being washed in and out of the drain system. So that, that's a serious condition. But most common, you'll see if they're not maintaining the trees away from the toe of the dam, that it can get filled with um, tree roots and basically makes, renders the whole drainage system ineffective and it can cause problems. The gates also need to be exercised. Never do anything like this. Here we've got three big boys, and this guy's using a big uh, pipe section to try and either open or close this gate. And, uh, if you do that, I can guarantee you that you're going to damage the gate. Uh, these gate systems are designed to be operated by one person with about 40 pounds of strength. And uh, one of three bad things can happen if you do that. Uh, the first one is that you can actually separate the sluice gate from its frame. And that's a very expensive repair, especially if it's under a deep uh, reservoir where you need a diver. And uh, that can create a, a world of hurt. The other thing that's more common is that you'll bend the stem and break it off of the stem guides because it's putting it under compression. And usually what's happening here is that there's some seepage and they're trying to shut it, so they're trying to put more and more force on it. And it can't shut anymore because it's not, it's not that it's not shut, it's just that the gate needs to be adjusted and they'll end up breaking the stem guides. And another thing that often happens is if it doesn't break on the stem or it doesn't break on the gate, it will break the operator. And in this case, that's what happened here. It actually separated that piece of cast metal. And the owner put a temporary um, clamp on it to hold it together, but it broke it right off. Here's another example. In this case, it was broke right at the top of the operator. And that generally means that the operator needs to be replaced. Uh, gates need to be um, lubricated. This was a failure 
where the uh, pins of the gate were not lubricated, and when they lifted it up, it was too much friction and it broke. And uh, when you're inspecting it, all the moving parts of the gate need to be lubricated and maintained. Here, the uh, gears were all contaminated with sand and grit, and that's something to inspect. Here, the gate is perforated and, and rusted through, so that's a problem. So that, that wraps up the uh, inspection part, and I just want to close with a couple of comments about some uh, more resources that are available to you. Uh, this, this is really maybe like drinking through a fire hose. Uh, the information came so fast. But at your own time, you can look at some other publications that are available at the ASDO website. And if you're not a member of ASDO, uh, they would welcome you into their membership. And they, they love to have dam owners there. And it's a great place to meet other dam owners and to share information and uh, to find solutions for some of the problems that you may be facing. But uh, I just want to show you a couple of important resources that I think you might find useful. And you can get these at the ASDO website. One is Guidelines for Operation and Maintenance of Dams. This one is, is for Texas. It's one of my favorite. It's well illustrated, and it covers a lot of the material that we talked about. Another one was put together by FEMA, and, is tied, it, and these are all for dam owners. And it's titled Impacts of Animals on Earth and the Dams. Depending upon where you, you are in the country, uh, whether it's alligators or groundhogs or turtles, if you've got an infestation and they're damaging your structure, it helps you develop strategies to take care of that. Here's another great one. It's Impacts of Plant on Earth and Embankments. If you inherit a dam that has a lot of tree growth on it and you want to manage that and, and figure out how to deal with it, it, it has all kinds of examples. If you have a dam in a remote area and it, you can't get out there and mow it, it gives you all kinds of other uh, methods to control the vegetation. Uh, this is an excellent one on conduits through embankment dams. It talks about best practices, about design, construction, how to inspect them, and things like that. Uh, here's one on training aids. It's how to organize and operate and main, uh, an operation and maintenance program. And it actually has uh, manuals and videos that you can look at uh, to do that and get that information. And this is a very recent one, too, put out by FEMA uh, and Homeland Security. And that's how to harden your dam, especially if you think it's a target for vandalism or terrorism. Um, if you're not a member of ASDO, it, it, it is the best place. To, I think they are the premier dam safety organization in the world. Um, in my lifetime, I've been a member now for about 27 years. And they've only been around for about 30 years. And I have just seen remarkable things happen because of the volunteer work that that the membership does, as well as uh, the, or the members that, that keep that organization running. And I, I would encourage you to go to an annual conference. If you can't go to an annual conference, go to um, one of the um, regional conferences. And if you can't do that, uh, go to one of the uh, dam owner workshops that, that your state offers through the association. Sean, I've, I've got five minutes left to answer questions. and. Let's see. I've got one question here. If my dam isn't equipped with a seep weir conduit, do you recommend installing one in order to de determine seep flow? Absolutely. The, the most important um, thing to monitor at a dam is seepage, because it, it really is the best indication of how your dam is performing. And if you do have seepage at a point in your dam where it's concentrated and you're able to collect it, um, you want to monitor it. Now, there's two pieces of information you need. One is what is the reservoir level, and then what is the, the rate of seepage that's occurring at that location. Because as the reservoir level goes up, you would expect more seepage. As it goes down, you would expect less. If it was empty, you would expect no seepage. And what you're looking for is, is it changing with time? Because if it's increasing with time, I can guarantee you that one day you're going to have a big problem. And that's something you would want to know. Now, the other thing you want to know is that seepage could be coming from other sources. It could be coming from uh, maybe you have some rain, and it could be coming from the abutment, from groundwater, or something like that. So whenever you take a seepage me measurement, it's also good to note, um, has it been a dry week? Did it rain recently? Or something like that. Because you need to connect all the dots and correlate it. 
and make sure that that seepage is, is really coming from the reservoir through the dam and not from another source. Uh, another good question here, um, do you have any best practices for maintaining riprap surfaces as far as woody vegetation goes? Yeah, I've got a couple of things. If you're allowed to, use Roundup or a chemical agent and get it while it's early, and that way you don't have to go in and do any cutting. But if that's around a water supply source, you need to be careful and get a permit and coordinate it. Uh, another effective solution I saw, especially a lot of federal agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service will do this, is that uh, once a year they'll get um, prison labor uh, to assist them, and they'll go out on a, fr on a nice day, and they'll go out and do a lot of the manual work that has to be done to remove that type of vegetation. But uh, when, they, when you do have trees and stuff growing through rock fill, that can be a real problem. So those are two good strategies. One is manual labor, and the other one is, is using chemicals. Sometimes you can use uh, a biocide as well that will prevent it from happening in the first place. So you can place that underneath the riprap, and it will prevent growth from occurring. It will deter it. But be careful about the environment when you do that. I think I'm up to speed on all the questions, Sean. Did I miss any? That looks good to me. Okay. And I think we're right into our last minute. <clears throat> we sure are. Any closing remarks for our audience, Paul? Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for taking time, especially out of their evening, to um, educate themselves on uh, what some of the responsibilities associated with owning and operating dams. It sure is a big responsibility. Uh, dams are very important. They're necessary. And uh, maintaining them is, is a very important um, uh, function. And, and the dam owners, I'd like to encourage you to you know, be part of the Association of Dam Safety Officials, officials and especially in their vision of making a future where all dams are safe, because really you are the first line of defense. And uh, I wish you well. I encourage you to uh, you know, take good care of your dams. And if I can be of any help to you, um, don't hesitate to email or, or contact me. Thank okay. you, Sean. Super. Thank you very much. And with that, we will conclude today's online seminar. Today's program is copyright 2013 by the Association of State Dam Safety Officials with All Rights Reserved. This concludes today's program. You may now disconnect.